ethics and and he was pretty thoroughly uh, disgraced and demolished. Uh, this Yankee and cowboy war is uh, probably uh, gradually being replaced as the two forces are going to be driven to combine against the rising threat that's coming from Japan once again. The last time the threat came from Japan, it came in military form. Then the Japanese wrote pacifism in their constitution, and now they represent an economic threat. And there is this rising anxiety about Japanese uh, efficiency and technology and why do they do things so much cheaper and quicker and so on. And in fact, uh, every part of the computer field in which the United States doesn't lead, the Japanese do lead already. And in some parts, the Japanese are leading more and more. And it looks like where America is in the lead, the Japanese are catching up. So it seems this west to east thing has gone all the way around the globe in the last... Uh, 5,000 years since the Bronze Age began. Uh, it's not only gone all around the globe, it has more and more feedback incorporated into it. Uh, by the time the center of power had moved from Thailand to Rome, uh, the, mo most of the knowledge from Rome wasn't getting back to Thailand, let's say, although some of it was getting back to China by way of the Silk Road, which went from Rome to North India and from North India to China which explains a lot of the similarities between mystical traditions in China and Gnosticism in Rome. They were both being passed back and forth through northern India. Uh, but by, uh, well, a, lot of, a lot of the Roman knowledge wasn't getting back to Thailand, and by the time of the rise of the great Italian city-states around 1500, the Renaissance, that knowledge was not getting back as far as uh, the Near East even. Uh, but as this process has accelerated, the more knowledge that's accumulated in one place, the faster it gets around the whole world. Like TV, when I started high school, there were no TV sets outside of laboratories. By the time I graduated from high school, you couldn't look over any American city without seeing a sea of TV aerials. A whole revolution had occurred in just four years. Something similar has been happening with computers in this decade. They've spread across the whole country with tremendous rapidity. But meanwhile, knowledge, wherever it's discovered, is traveling over the whole world faster and faster. So the movement of knowledge and power from east to west over the last several thousand years has now become a, an oscillation in which the knowledge is circling the globe faster and faster, very palpably and physically in the form of the satellites up there, which are circling the globe and serving as the communication network of the emerging global brain. The average mammal is not a caribou. Uh, caribous migrate over thousands of miles every year, but the average mammal looks more like a mouse or a hedgehog. Most mammals are quite small. They live less than 10 years, and they never travel more than 10 miles from the place where they're born. Most mice never get anywhere and never get more than a few miles from where they're born. Most squirrels never go more than a few miles from where they're born. Most human beings throughout history have lived about 30 years and have never gotten more than 10 miles from where they were born. There have always been exceptions. There are Phoenician carvings in Virginia. There's a record of a Chinese philosopher who visited Athens at the time of Plato. Uh, there are those Latin sails that found their way from Thailand to Western Ireland. But by and large, most human beings uh, throughout history have, haven't got any further than 10 miles from where they were born and they haven't lived more than 30 years. At the time of the French Revolution, average life expectancy in Europe was 27 years. When Engels wrote The Condition of the Working Class in England in the middle of the 19th century, a life expectancy among the working class was still under 40 years. It was 37 and a half years. By 1900, life expectancy for the middle classes in the United States was 50 years. It was still lower than that for the working classes. The latest estimate is that in the Western democracies, for all classes, uh, due to welfare and the dole and Social Security and so on, for all classes, it has averaged out to 72 and a half years. So we have been traveling further and further throughout history, and lifespan has been getting longer and longer, just as knowledge has been doubling more and more. The general pattern that emerges as one contemplates the structure in history is the pattern that Timothy Leary with his great skill for Madison Avenue uh, techniques has uh, put into the slogan SMILE, S-M-I squared L-E. That means space migration, intelligence increase, and life extension. 
we have always, we have been traveling further and further. Now we're going into space. So space migration is the obvious next step. And a recent poll in Europe showed that 90% of the children in uh, grammar school uh, in Europe expect to go into space when they grow up. I'm sure a similar poll in the United States would get the same result. I read recently that there isn't a single hour of the day of the 24 hours in which there aren't people looking at Star Trek somewhere on this planet. <laughs> well, all you have to do is say, beam me down, Scotty, no matter where you are, and everybody knows what you're referring to. Or all you have to do is make this gesture, and people say, live long and prosper in whatever language they, they're speaking. A large part of our communication technology is already in space, and uh, the obvious next step is to put our industrial technology into space. For one thing, as Bucky Fuller pointed out, the nearest naturally occurring nuclear engine to us is 93 million miles away. That may give us a, a rough idea of nature's system of organizing things. Nuclear energy should be 93 million miles from human beings. So the obvious thing is to put the nuclear plants into space around 93 million miles away. Uh, but uh, a great deal of other technology can very profitably be moved into outer space. Uh, Robert Heinlein was the first one to suggest putting nuclear plants into space. That was back in the 1940s in a science fiction story called Blow Ups Happen, which is based on Murphy's Law. Blow Ups Happen. So get them the hell away from us. Uh, uh, Ger Gerard O'Neill in the 1960s had his class at Princeton consider the question for the first time in terrestrial history, is the surface of, planet, is the surface of a planet the best place for an advanced technology. And once the question was raised, uh, the students began examining it, and they all came to the same agreement. The more you examine it, the more obvious it is that an advanced technology does not belong on the surface of a planet. It is much more profitable to put it into outer space, and it is much safer to put it into outer space, too. G. Harry Stein of NASA has calculated that there are 10 to the 100th power industrial processes that can be done cheaper in outer space. So the communication satellites are out there now because they were the easiest things to put up and the quickest to make a profit. But the rest of technology is going to go into outer space, too, because it's much cheaper to do things out there. You, got, you have very high-grade vacuum, and you can have any degree of gravity you want, depending on how you build your space station. You build a space station to spin in the proper way, you can have normal Earth gravity out at the perimeter, and you can have zero gravity in the middle and different degrees of gravity in between. And you can do all sorts of processes you can't do in a gravity well like the Earth. And you can do most processes cheaper and more efficiently. Ten to the hundredth power industrial processes can be done cheaper and more efficiently in space. So technology is migrating into space, and people will be migrating along with it. First technologists, and then teachers, because there's going to have to be schools for the technologists' children, and then hospitals, and then doctors and nurses, and then uh, entertainment will move out into space. I hope to be the first writer in residence uh, on the L5 space colony. Only I don't want it called L5. I want it called Proxmire. So, so the first generation of children born there can go around asking, why is this place called Proxmire? I got that idea from Ted Sturgeon. As for intelligence increase throughout history, uh, there's been this uh, general impression that stupidity was an incurable problem. Uh, Voltaire sort of summarized all thinking up until his time when he said that the only way to get an, an inkling of what mathematicians mean by infinity is to consider the extent of human stupidity. Uh, but that, that's because he was considering religious history. If you look at political history, you find that the stupidity doesn't tend to be quite so long-lasting. The general pattern is religious stupidity exists for millenniums, political stupidity exists for centuries, scientific stupidity exists only for generations before it gets cured. So there are different ratios of recovering from stupidity depending on what method you're using. The theological method sort of guarantees that you can remain stupid indefinitely or until a major calamity forces a change. Uh, the political method allows you to remain stupid for many generations until you've antagonized enough of the world that they come in and sack your cities. And uh, 
Now, scientific stupidity only lasts until a generation is born bright enough to start asking basic questions again and not just following what the teacher tells them. Uh, the, uh, the possibility of uh, changing consciousness was discovered in the Orient 2,500 years ago, at least. Probably it's older than that. But techniques were discovered to quiet the mind, pacify the mind, remove emotional compulsions. And these were organized into the science of yoga. Uh, as John Lilly says, yoga is the science of the East, as science is the yoga of the West. Science is a yoga, too. Science is a way of trying to reach an objective level in which your emotional compulsions and prejudices aren't twisting all the facts to fit in with your favorite reality tunnel. Uh, science and yoga have a lot in common. Uh, the scientific worldview grew up in the West, West between 1500 and 1750, largely due to mystics who were known as hermeticists. And one of the key figures of that period was Giordano Bruno, who was uh, burned at the stake in Rome in 1600 for, among other things, teaching the Copernican theory that the Earth was not the center of the universe, but also on charges that he had organized secret societies to conspire to overthrow the Catholic Church. And there is some evidence that the secret societies Bruno founded are what have come down to us and uh, through various dilutions as Rosicrucianism and Freemasonry. This hermetic scientific revolution between 1500 and 1750 saw theology as its enemy and, uh, so, and there was no conflict between hermeticism and science. They were both based on experiment, uh, find out what happens if you do this, and they were both opposed to the authority of the church. Shortly after 1600, this began to split and the hermetic tradition uh, faded into the background and we developed for the first time in history a science that had absolutely no connection with uh, anything except pure reason. Uh, the hermetic tradition was that there is no such thing as pure reason. You've got to first work on your own perceiving apparatus to correct your prejudices, and the scientist is not separate from what the scientist observes. And uh, the, the general uh, yogic attitude that you, uh, you are the master who makes the grass green. Uh, Western science lost that insight, and from Newton onwards, we had the idea that it doesn't matter who you are. If you follow scientific procedure, you'll find the truth. Uh, this began to break down after 1900 due to Sigmund Freud, uh, who pointed out that even scientists are human beings and may have neuroses, and that scientific theories may be elaborate rationalizations for neuroses, and the influence of Karl Marx, who pointed out that no matter what you theorize,